Hello, Internet, on all the platforms, which I'll leave nameless right now. We're on several. I am Thomas Manton IV. Um, we're on at least three platforms, I think, right now. So, hello, welcome, anybody that's new that's coming on that hasn't been with us before. I'm going to speak about the laws of success. I have a great book that the reprint of this is coming out this week, an expanded edition, really a phenomenal, phenomenal message God gave me. I won't talk a lot about that. I want to get right into it. And I have another one that is in print right now that's ready, Prophetic Keys to Successful Living with the forward written, written by the illustrious Archbishop and who's our friend and he can uh, tell you what to think about me by what he wrote. It's worth getting this book just to see what the Archbishop Harrison Nanga said about me. The mantle we carry, the effect of our ministry upon the nation and nations. It's been amazing. So let me get right into it. I want to say some very strong things, so I'll affectionately call this a prophetic uh, version of the laws of success teaching. So God wants us to know one thing. I want to say rule number one. Ignorance is too costly. Lack of knowledge and not knowing something is very bad. If you don't know, you can't do. And if you don't do, you don't get. And if you don't do and get, you're not living the life you're supposed to be living. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people my people. Someone said, I'm praying about it. Not enough. Someone said, I love God. Oh, good. Someone said, I, I reverence God. So does the devil. And the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So there's no, absolutely no, escaping the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord that there are saviors on Mount Zion, meaning God and his representatives, because there's only one savior, it's Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There's only one. There's no other, but Obadiah 1, 17 to 20 talks about saviors. What does it mean? Why did it say plural? Why did the prophet say that? What it means clearly and specifically is this. Jesus is Lord. We're working with him. And uh, <laughs> we're... We're his reps. <laughs> he said, I, I also no longer call you servants, but I call you my friends. So uh, the friend of God is not going to be an ignorant person. The friend of God is not going to be a lazy person. The friend of God is not going to be a person who doesn't like understand anything or know what to do. And uh, it's high time, it's beyond high time that we rise up and get things. One thing that, that is a gift of the Holy Spirit to us that is very painful is this thing called conviction. Conviction of what? Things we didn't do that we were supposed to do. Things maybe that we allowed that we shouldn't have allowed. Things that we uh, were involved in that we shouldn't have been involved in. Meaning also associations, environments, and relationships. And I'm not talking about sinful things now. I'm talking about the realm of progress, of success. If you're in a dull environment, you'll have a dull outcome. If you're in a sharp, brilliant environment, you'll have a brilliant, sharp outcome. Some things come to you by association. There's a thing that I've taught on for years called increase by association. Increase by association. There is a realm of increase that comes by who you're connected with and the Lord really wants us to uh, upgrade everything God is the God of the upgrades he's the God who helps us produce wealth he's the God who causes us to have understanding and favor and power and glory and honor according to his own nature Revelation 5.12 says something so powerful. Jesus, the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world, came to do this, 
that give us power and riches and wisdom and strength and glory, honor, and blessing, or blessing, glory, and honor, however you want to word it, for the purpose of us taking dominion. Revelation 1, 6 said we're kings and priests. Paul said we reign as kings in life. Peter said, is it 1 Peter 2, 9, something like that, we're somewhere in there, I think it is. I, I don't know the exact verse of it offhand. We're, we're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We're royal, royal. Royal means what? You can't mistake royalty for anything else. If you use the word royal, it's something that's on a high level or supposed to be. A king is not a broke person, neither is a queen. They have a kingdom, they have a palace, they have palaces, they have all kinds of things. So it's very disturbing to look at the state of people and how they're living in poverty and in the mess. But guess what? They did it to themselves. This is a time to own up. And I'm saying this prophetically. People need to take analysis of themselves and their environment and not put up with things that are causing them to lack or to be stuck. Anything that slows you down is of the devil. Anything that causes you to suffer loss is evil. Even if it's in a stupid person that's next to you, kick the stupid person off to the curb and say bye-bye to you. I love you anyway. Maybe you have a place somewhere, but it's not standing next to me because you're clouding my thinking. You know? And the best friend to have is laws of success. The best friend to have is the Holy Spirit. Now you go into the world system. They talk about how to do marketing, branding, believe in yourself, uh, cultivate relationships, get wisdom through learning. All of that is powerful, and the first one that ever said all that was God. However, there's an element of knowing God and receiving His power that He can teach you Himself. Remember the Scripture says He'll be our teacher. Jesus said He'll lead you and guide you into all truth. The things that I've said to you, the Holy Spirit will remind you of those and uh, lead you and guide you into all truth. John 8, 32 said, you'll know the truth, the truth will make you free. In other words, you won't remain the same as how you were. Destroyed for lack of knowledge. Have you ever woken up in life to a revelation and it's very painful? That's part of the process of God. If he doesn't give that to you, nothing will really change. So you want to be successful, it's going to take a lot of pain. And I got to say something on, on this that I want to really balance this out. Doctrinally speaking, these people that think we're just supposed to suffer and suffer loss and suffer delays and blame it on God, or maybe I wasn't ready, or maybe it wasn't God's timing, that is the epitome of stupidity. Jesus was ready 2,000 years ago. Guess what he said? He didn't say it's in progress. He said, it's finished. You ever thought about that? That means everything's ready now. This thing about God's timing is a bunch of foolishness. I have a guy that gave me a book one time. He's, he talked about divine delays or something like that that are from God. I took the book and I threw it to the side. I said, I'm not even going to open this. I have no interest in this realm of thought. Let me tell you something. In, this, in the last days, everything is now. You got to live like, you got to live and operate like, like this is it. This is the end of the day. This is the end of the hour. This is the last hour. I was praying early this morning and I was talking to the Lord in a real interesting realm of glory. I, it was interesting, very interesting. And I thought the things that were coming from my spirit in the presence of God that I was saying to him, I was like, Lord, help, help, help me, help us. The time is now. This is the last hour. This is what I was saying to God. This is the last hour. Now, not for me. I'm into long life. Psalm 91, 16, I've claimed it. Even if someone thought they were going to die, Hezekiah went and cried to God, and God gave him 15 more years. And then look at the guys that lived to 777, 650, 950, 930, 969. Methuselah was the oldest man. So in those days, they lived long. Then after the flood, you know, the scripture said that the days of man should be 120 years. But there's a psalm that says, by cause of whatever, 
three score and 10 or 20, which is 70 or 80. The devil is a liar. I don't, I don't take that. Even if, even if it's written in the verse, I don't accept that. The days of man should be 120. I don't necessarily purport to want to live to 120 because I don't want to be like walking sideways and trying to hold on to something and see where I'm going. And You know, you know, when you're that age, I mean, can you imagine if you were 111? How would you feel? I don't know. Can you still preach? I don't know. Can you still rump, uh, run? Can you still jump? I, I, I wanted to say jump and run at the same time. I made a word, rump. Jump and run. Can you do that? I don't think so. You know, so like you got to figure it out. But 70, are you kidding me? 70 is young. You tell a person in their 60s, 70 is it? You're like, you mean a few more years? That's all? No. 80, still young. After that, eh, 90, oh, I don't know. If you got something good to do, you know, okay, but. But are you seeing the seriousness of time? And I speak to break the head of every preacher. And I say this as God's prophet. Someone thought, see, see, there's this thought in the body. There's this thought even in culture because it's your own people. They could do nothing wrong by you. You know, when someone's an evil, trash heap, filthy, lying, cheating, conniving, con artist, corrupt, subversive, undermining, lying, crooked thief of a devil, in your society, here's the things you say. Oh, forget about them. Forgive them. You know, the purpose of the good people is to help the evil people. You ever hear statements like that? These all come from the church. Who taught them that? I don't know if it was the colonialists that taught, you know, uh, the missionaries that came and teach people like forgive and accept everything that's evil that anybody does because the Bible says servants obey your masters no matter what they do. You know, maybe it came from that. I don't have time to get into that. But whatever causes this, this thing about suffering and loss, delay or overlooking evil is evil. And God never said all that. He's not interested in us, uh, you know, waiting for anything or thinking it's okay to be delayed or denied or to be small. I have one friend who's very rich in business, and I'm very annoyed at him the way he preaches. I will not listen to him preach because he preaches all this psychobabble, emotional blah, blah, and he's saying things like, you know, be humble, be dead, don't be seen. And all this, I think he's talking to himself. Maybe that's he's chiding himself because he has so much money that he has to put himself down. But that's, let me tell you what I felt. That's not the message to the people. The people need to be raised up. And then this thing about, oh, hide me behind the cross, you know, don't let me be seen. I'm nobody. Who told you that? What scripture is that? It's an old hymn. It's a thought. It came from a preacher. What scripture is that? Deny yourself and follow me, meaning it's going to cost you something to follow me. But it doesn't mean that you're nobody. If Christ Jesus, the King of glory, lives in you, are you a nobody? <laughs> oh, it's not, oh, it's not about me, you know. The more you keep saying that, you're going to diminish yourself and you're going to, you're going to be able to do less. I'm preaching good here. I'm teaching good here. This is great. It, it does have something to do with you because you're the one that carries it out. Without you in the, in the program, it doesn't happen. God said, you do the work. I'm up here. You're down there. I'll help you. I'll anoint you. I'll empower you. I'll give you the brilliance and the wisdom, but you go and do the work. So we want the gospel to go out to the world. We want business to thrive and flourish. Jesus is going to come down, walk around again, and go out and do the business for you. Make the phone calls, arrange the things, do the marketing, do the branding, do the sales. Everything good depends on sales. Someone said, if they were a millionaire or a billionaire and they lost their money or they had to start again, what's the best thing to ensure that they'll be wealthy again? 
and they said this. Somebody said this. I really like it. Sales. I would get into sales because everything has to be sold, and that's what produces commerce. You could be in the wrong environment selling something, and you'll not make it. So there are other factors to it. You got to be in the right place. It's dawning on me that a lot of things we've been trying to bless people in ways we've been trying to bless people is non-conducive to the work of God on our end. So guess what? We are changing everything to work of the vision in the vision that God has ordained for us to work in. I have a friend. I love, I love mentorship. I love people that are powerful. You listen to them, you get thoughts. You go, ooh. Because somebody's walking it out and you can learn from them. Which tells me this, success principle, a law of success. No man is an island. Solitary can seem good in some ways, but it's very costly in the long run. You sometimes walk in the realm of doing something yourself, and because of that, you're thinking from your own sphere of what goes on in your mind, and you were not doing certain other things that you needed to do because you didn't have the, uh, the spark from somebody else. Can somebody say amen or ouch or hallelujah or oh my God, help me, one of the four or all four. Say amen, ouch, hallelujah, and oh my God, please help me. Environment matters. Not something lives matters. Whose lives matters? Because that's all a sham. Do you know the sham of these people that made these organizations but had backing? They built houses for themselves, bought million dollar mansions, and they, they never did they never did anything for the community. So that's another issue altogether. Because it seemed like it's something people wanted to hear, so they grabbed onto that. Nice business strategy, but if you end up in hell for being a deceptive person and a liar and a thief, and you never did anything about the thing you purported the organization to be about, but all you did was put money in your pocket, that is criminal in the eyes of God. Now, maybe in the realm of man's thing, you might get away with it, but you're a deceiver and a liar, and God doesn't take kindly to that. But what does matter? How we think, what we do, the choices we make. So much are in these two books that I wrote, Prophetic Keys to Successful Living and The Laws of Success, which is coming out in the next week or so in an expanded edition. I'm very excited about that. This will be in print. It'll be, they're both in ebook. This is already available in ebook, and so is this. But this, the new one, will be available as an ebook also, and it'll also be in hard, a hard, or well, soft, soft, uh, soft copies, what? Now I'm thinking a hardback and paperback. It'll be available. Hard copy is the printed thing, even if it's, you know, that doesn't have this, the hard spine on it. Hard shell books. I have one man of God who, a friend of mine who did those. He said he'll never do them again. They're too much, they're too costly and too crazy to print. But he was such a brilliant writer. He did all that. He had hardcover books, soft cover, paperback form and whatever. These are great. Now let me tell you about the greatest book of all time is this right here, the Holy Bible. Forty authors over 1,500 years, 66 books. Isaiah was gifted by God to have 66 chapters, which is the same amount of number of books in the Bible, which is fabulous. About 865,000 words, thousands of promises, the doctrine of God, the mind of God for, for us as people. It's all in here. What a phenomenal thing. Now, I want to read two verses before I, before I finish on from Isaiah 48 and 49. Just hold on a minute for that. So the Lord is help, wanting to help us think right and to become cognizant of some things and aware of some things, which is a very painful process because you have to live with the fact of, of, of regret, thinking of something you didn't do before, And you've lost the time of that. You know, money can be replaced, even some things can be replaced, but time can never be replaced. Once it's gone, it's gone. And that's so sad, isn't it? 
Rashakara Marindili Sakalavashaya. I want to I want to uh, finish on this point about about doctrinal understanding. Anybody that would teach you like to slow down or wait or you know act all spiritual like everything is God's timing or then you feel like no responsibility the, the to do anything and you don't get anything done really in any great proportion or capacity that's your fault. It's a fault of you not thinking correctly about situations in life. And whoever taught you that is really in is, is going to have a rude awakening when God comes to call them to account for what they've been teaching. James said, don't want to, don't, don't be quick to want to be a teacher because you have greater accountability. You know, one thing I love about this anointing in my life and the brilliance in me is that I teach very powerful, profound things that are life enhancing for people. Life advancing for people. I'm very thrilled about that. To God be the glory. No man could do these things of the Spirit except God be with him. But I'm thrilled that something tangibly substantive and life enhancing information, revelation, empowerment is coming through us. And that's all right. I mean, it's all right. A L L space R I G H T. It's all correct. It's all right. Something. A lot of people aren't doing it. Can you imagine people that go to a church and they sing some songs and then the preacher gets up and they say some, all these kind of things, and nobody leaves with a feeling of conviction and the Holy Spirit's not really there in manifestation either. They don't feel empowered. They don't feel stirred up to go and do something. What a, what a tragic mess, and we call that the church. Part of a job of a leader is to rebuke things. A law for success, a law of success. To rebuke wrong and evil things. Even other people in the body of Christ that are doing wrong. Correction. A lot of people don't know that. You know, when you're correcting something, you're not speaking against somebody. You're you're dealing with an issue of some way that something's wrong. Instagram, I see a few of you there. God bless you. Thank you for coming on. I'm going to start doing Instagram live more. I used to do it, but I'm back to it now. I'm going to do it a lot. We had great viewership from Instagram some time back, and I don't know how I got away from it, but we got to get back into it. So I'm looking for the timer because I think it used to be where they give you an hour whatever. If, it, if I see the thing click countdown, I'll just go boom, and we'll talk to you on the next one. Share this with your friends, because people need to be hearing what I'm saying right now. In Jesus' name. Let me read something from Isaiah. Isaiah 48. I tweak a giraffe uh, bookmarker my Bible Isaiah 48 12 listen to me I am he I am first I am also the last indeed my hand has laid the foundation of the earth my right hand has stretched out the heavens when I call to them they stand up together what does that tell you about the power of God's creative brilliance and authority a lot all of you assemble yourselves together and hear God said I've spoken and I've called this one I want to liken that to myself now it's Israel you even talked about Babylon He'll do his pleasure on Babylon. In other words, that's the evil ones. His arm shall be against the Chaldeans. So Babylonians and the Chaldeans in the Bible were symbolic of the devil's ugly friends who were against the good people. And then God said in the 15th verse in Isaiah 48, I, even I, have spoken. Yes, I have called him. Who? 
Israel, the nation, Jesus to come, Thomas to come. Here I am right here. So I'll liken that. I'll put myself in there. Someone said, that's a big thing to do. What, what am I, stupid? What am I going to sit around and be a, a nobody? You think God ever called us to be a nobody? Let me tell you something I had in my spirit earlier, and it's coming to me right now when I started reading the scripture. Anybody that's powerful in life has been like a bulldozer. They've gone to knock down the wrong things and raise up and build up the right things. And if you don't have that kind of nature to do that, you're not going to do anything powerful. Sit back, be quiet all you want. I'm just humble. I'm quiet. I'm soft-spoken. I don't have any personality. I don't ever speak much. I just stay to myself. Guess what? Your life will be like that to yourself. And you'll, you'll live and gone. You'll live and be gone later and have done nothing. No one will remember your name because you didn't contribute anything to the human experience on earth. That is a tragedy. Now, is everybody an apostle? No, I heard a man of God talking about this. He said, there are many Timothys. There are many Stephens. There are many Philip evangelists. There are many different gifts. There are the Luke 8, 1 to 3. There's Mary Magdalene, of whom was cast out seven devils, and she followed Jesus. There was Joanna and Susanna, who were giving uh, to the ministry. There's Lydia of, of, of uh, Lystra, Thyatira, and she help Paul, Paul's entourage. She was a facilitator for the movement. Didn't say she was a prophet, prophetess, preacher. Amen. Deborah, in the book of Judges chapter 1, she, she was, the, the Bible says there were men called and the men were lazy, so God stepped past them and got a hold of Deborah and Bay, Barak, her friend there, and they rose up and began to do something but not the first choice. Catherine Coleman, the great healing evangelist, said she was not the first choice. In fact, she felt like she was the fifth or sixth choice. That's what she kind of felt. She said that. She said, God, like, like Isaiah, if you could use me as messed up as I am, as whatever I am, here am I, send me. And Catherine Coleman got the calling. But there were men, even male figures, men in ministry that should have carried that healing glory and they fell upon the woman. And she's the one that said that God showed us she was not the first choice for that ministry. Can you imagine? But she stood up. Hello? Deborah and Bay Bayrock stood up. Gideon said, who, me, when the angel came for him? He stood up and went for it. But he didn't feel like doing it at first. He didn't feel qualified. Isaiah said he's a man of uncleanness. His people were unclean. God, why would you call me? And then Isaiah, but he said, if you want to use me, here am I, send me in Isaiah chapter 6. And he became one of the greatest prophets that ever lived in human history, the prophet Isaiah. And I'm reading from him right now in the book of Isaiah, the 48th chapter. Look at this. So the Lord says, I've called him. I put my name there, Thomas Manta IV. Okay, it was Israel. Okay, it was Jesus. Okay, it was all of them. What about me? Okay, Abraham was called. Moses was called. Elijah was called. But what about me and my generation? You know, make your calling and election sure, 2 Peter 1.10 says. Make your calling and election sure, because if you do these things, you'll never, you'll never be stopped. If you have trouble along the way, God will help you and you'll keep moving, but nothing can stop you. Come near to me and hear this. He says, I've brought him, I've called him, Isaiah 48, 15. I've called him and whoever else was called, but definitely me. Hello. And his way will prosper. Oh, yes. Come near to me. Hear this. For I've not spoken in secret from the beginning. For the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's me again. Whoever else it was for? Hakuna Shida. No problem. It was for them. But it's also for me. And it's also for you. Thus says the Lord, 17th verse, famous, one of my favorites in the whole Bible. One of my beloved favorite scriptures. 
Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your descendants would have also already been like the sand and the offspring of your body like the grains of sand. His name would not have been cut off or destro nor destroyed from before me. Oh, go forth from Babylon, free, flee from the, Bab the Chaldeans. Let's go and Kikuyu for a second there. Free from the Chaldeans. No, it's flee. Go forth from Babylon. I'm having a Kikuyu moment. Flee from the Chaldeans with a voice of singing. Declare and proclaim this utter to the ends of the earth and say the Lord has redeemed his servant. Jacob, yes, but Thomas, yes. Hello. Let's go to 49. I found something powerful here. Verse uh, 8. Thus says the Lord, Isaiah 49, verse 8. And now before that, in Isaiah 48, 17, he said he wants us to profit. So if you're not profiting, P-R-O-F-I-T, through the prophet also, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, carrying this anointing to help you prophet, something's wrong. And you have to make adjustments. Law of success. Make every adjustment you can make. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. Verse 7. Let me go back to verse 7 a little bit. Skip down to the verse a little bit to the second part. Kings will see and rise... Princes will also worship because the Lord who was faithful, the Holy One of Israel, He has chosen you. My God. My God, this is powerful. What's our problem? We have too many, we think, but God has chosen us, so everything has to get fixed. God, may God give us the wisdom, I prophesy. God's going to give us the wisdom and the discernment and knowledge and understanding and direction and counsel and the right environment, the right people, the right friends, the right connection, and the right sources of information and knowledge and sources of help and provisions and all that. We can do everything that he's ordained us to do. In Jesus' name, it is done. It is so. The Holy One himself has, has chosen you. Oh, my God. He said, I'll preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth. That's our job. To cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. That you may say to people, go forth. And you that have been in darkness, show yourselves. And uh, that, that's exposing the wicked, but that's also helping people to get free, I believe, both ways. And you'll feed along the roads. Your pastures will be on all the desolate heights. And there'll be neither hunger nor thirst anymore. And everything will be good. For God's mercy upon them will lead them. Even by the springs of water. I'll make each of my mountains a road. My highway shall be elevated surely. Those shall come from afar. Look from the north and the west. And then from the lands of wherever that was. Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth. Break out into singing, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people. He'll have mercy on his afflicted. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Afflicted no more. The Lord spoke to me two days ago. Let me continue. He said, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, but I will not forget you. I've inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continuously before me. Your sons shall make haste. Your destroyers and those who laid you waste shall go away from you. Lord Jesus. That's another one. Somebody put that into WhatsApp. 4917 Isaiah. Isaiah 4917. Send me that. I need it. With the list of the others. Psalm 63 verses 9 and 10. Proverbs 17, 13. Isaiah 1, 11. Please remember those. Send those to me on WhatsApp. I'm making a little document of it and a message out of it. And I want to send it to some people. 
And this is the scripture. See, you need the Bible promise when you want to be successful, when you want to have something great, you want a manifestation. Take it from the word. They'll go away from you. Look up, lift up your eyes, the evildoers. They'll go away from you. Look around and see, and they'll even be destroyed, other verses say. Let me not get into that right now. All these gather together and come to you as I live, says the Lord. You should surely close, clothe yourselves with them as an ornament. And for your waste and your desolate places and lands of your destruction, now, even now, will be too small for the inhabitants. And those who swallowed you up will be far away. Those trash heaps of people that have messed you up along the way, they're gone forever. Remember that these, these Egyptians, they said, you'll, from now you'll never see them anymore. Those evil, those evil trash heaps of that were given birth to by a woman, but they live like the devil. The future is not bright for some people, but you have to concern concern yourself with yourself and the life you're supposed to live now. Right here from Isaiah 48 and 49 alone, you see at the power of the scripture. And if we never got into it, how on earth are we going to uh, how on earth are we going to live a, a great life? People that are successful, they're like bulldozers. They knock things down that are evil and they build things up that are supposed to be built up. And if you're not doing that, I preached something. We found a clip from it, from one of my messages that said, if no one knows your name, you haven't done anything yet for the world. Someone said, am I supposed to do everything for the world? No, I didn't say you are. But you're supposed to do something. You're supposed to do something. Some people's assignment is not something they think is something so grandiose and famous and all that. It's just to do well in what you're doing now to give life to it, to help something progress forward. That honors God because you're, then you're involved in the whole picture, the big picture of what was done through a certain, you know, ministry, company, organization, family, realm of, of, of a community. Everybody has a part to play in that. And I declare in Jesus' name that God's going to help you get that sorted out. Anything that's stole from you needs to be rectified now. Another law of success is this, to know that it's not too late. Write that down. It's not too late. It's not too late for me to flourish and get things done that I need to get done. It's not too late. God is great, and because of his power, I'm great. So it's not too late. It's never too late. Someone said, yeah, but I miss so much. I miss so many things, and I'm, is there hope? Yes, absolutely. I was also praying earlier, and I said to the Lord, I was walking somewhere. Where was that? And I said, <laughs> I said, here I am. Again, use me. Here I am. Alive, walking around, ready to do everything you want. Right here, right now. very powerful to, for, for a lot of people right now. Let the Holy Ghost and fire touch you and anoint you afresh for what you, what you need to get done. You're not a loser. The devil's a loser. 
Maybe some people that you've known are losers. They're a wrong influence. It's time for you to cut ties and move and not be tied to certain things. Always be open to change and to move with the, the tide of the flow of the river of God. There's always new people, new situations, new everything. It's always, it's always available. You have to just say yes to it. The, the Lord spoke to me two days ago in the morning when I woke up. He said something very powerful. I was like, wow, thank you. That means the world. I don't know if I'll say what he said. Something for me about the coming days, how great they're going to be. I'll, I'll hint at it like that. He said something so powerful. He said, great days are ahead, my son. How many words is that? Great days are ahead. Four words, my son, six. Six is the number of man. Me, I'm a man. Great days are ahead. Do you know how encouraging that was? You know what that means? All the wealth, all the opportunity, all the production, all the provision, all the great things, all the exploits, all the feats of power that we're going to walk in, all the results of things to make us successful are all included in that. So God said that to me. I'm a leader. I'm a mentor. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a leader of a father to a lot of people. So take it. Take the grace as God gave it to me. I give it to you. Great days are ahead. When I first heard that, I was doing some teaching somewhere. I was, or I was talking to some people, some other leaders too. I, I didn't want to say what he said. I didn't feel like saying it. I just felt like keeping it to myself. But I feel as a leader, I need to also release that upon everybody. Take that from Jehovah. Great days are ahead. I said great days are ahead. It's the weakest amen I ever heard. Just forget it. I don't know about you. You'll see me shining and maybe you'll still be trying to figure it out. You better get busy and try to figure life out because life is uh, ticking away. A law of success is like self-analysis. Recollection of things, looking at things, observing things, and and being able to accept the fact and say, I didn't in my life I didn't do everything right that I, the way I should have done it. I didn't take every opportunity that I had. A lot of things I didn't do. A lot of things didn't get done. Why? And then you look at it and feeling pain and regret and torment over the fact that certain things I could be doing now or have now, I don't have, or I'm not doing them, or I didn't do them before. It's a terrible thought. But if you can't look at that and learn from your own stupidity. Now, one law of success is don't speak negative about yourself, but it's okay to admit the fact that you weren't as bright as you could have been all your life. You're not knocking yourself and calling yourself, labeling yourself as something bad. Because you're just saying that just wasn't right the way I did that. It, was, it wasn't the best use of time or, or the best way of doing things. I, I just didn't do it right. Yeah, yeah, you have to say that. That's a form of repentance also. But I'll tell you this, success, a success key, the revelation of the fact and truth that the devil is forever defeated. Him and his ugly Luciferian friends have no future. I don't care who they are and what they're trying to do in the world. Also, if we want to live a godly and peaceable life, we need to pray for those in rulership. It could be devils in Europe right now having their meetings and committees to try to plan what they want to do to the world. And they have, they're the elite billionaires gathering together to try to make decisions about what happens in humanity, the things that they're trying to do and setting up. It's horrible. But guess what? When it gets so bad to the point of 
clicking over to that son of perdition, the man of sin, the Antichrist, you know, the tribulation and mark of the beast and all that nonsense. We're going to get out of here. We're going to be caught up to meet the Lord. But, but we're not there yet. We can see things are progressing toward that in the days we're living in. I said to the Lord in prayer this morning in the spirit, this is the last hour, meaning, you know, an hour, a thousand years is like a day, so an hour could be a thousand divided by 24 is how much? 50 years? 40 years? A thousand years divided by 10 is 100. 24 is about, what, 40, 42 years or whatever. So you want to say an hour could be like that. I, I, I'm sure we don't have that much time. And most of us in our life, if you're a kid, a young person, you could you could have 42 years. But I know some people at their age, at 42, they break 100. Some will break 120. 42 years plus what you are now, huh, you don't have that much time. So we got to get on with, we have to live like as if we have a year left. We have to. And we don't. I, I trust we don't. But we have to live like, you know, this is it. There's no more time to sit around and plan. The purpose of planning, and many success teachers have talked, success teachers have talked about this, including my friend Miles Monroe and in the kingdom of God and a few others and people out in the world. You have to take time planning. It's laborious, but you have to write down and make a methodical program and plan for what you're going to do. It doesn't seem easy. Someone says, I'm very spontaneous. I know, I am too. But you have to plan. I even heard a man of God said, if you don't, and I got challenged by this, I don't know what I'm going to do about it. I'm going to do something about it because you can't hear that and then not do anything with it. That's, that wouldn't be right. This man of God said, if you don't make a schedule for your prayer life, like times and all that, see, they do, then how could you have a successful thing in your own prayer? I'm like, oh my God, please. So maybe it should be scheduled. He said, if you just pray, like let's say you're a student and you just study whenever you feel like it and you don't have a regimen time of, of doing things, a discipline time of doing things, you're not going to get high grades. You're not going to really be uh, on top of the class. There's a discipline that goes with all this. So what does it have to do with planning and structure? I think of one man who's very well-to-do, huge church, many, many, I don't want to say the number, many, many churches, so many now. And I think all he does is come out and speak for one hour in his language. And yeah, that, that, it's always similar, the same. It's like everybody is listening to him and then he goes back and prays and administrates sets up his systems. He's very brilliant in that way as an apostle. And the structure that he built, that he is, has built in his building and working with, is producing a lot. So I'm very challenged by that. You have to have a regimen. You have to have a discipline, law of success. You have to have a regimen and a discipline for your life. Uh, the, the great boxers, Muhammad Ali, Mike Tyson, these guys, they say, I have to do what I hate to produce what I love. I, I, I love being the champion, but I hate waking up at 4 o'clock, 4.30 in the morning, and then I have to go run five miles. Then I have to go to the gym, and I have to spar and exercise and all that. Even bodybuilders. Look at Arnold Schwarzenegger, who became like an eight-time Mr. Universe, Mr. Olympia, uh, you know, won all of those titles, and was, he's a, the most famous bodybuilder ever. There are other guys that were on par with him. Dennis Tenorino, who got saved and became a friend. He was Mr. Olympia, Mr. Universe a few times. But nobody really knows his name. But Schwarzenegger, because he went into Hollywood after that. But this guy, he was so disciplined and so hard on himself, and he worked so much. That's how he built that whole thing. People think that success is an accident. It's never an accident. Okay, don't, all right. It's never an accident.
There's an electrical company in New York that had this sign that said, perfection is not an accident. I thought that's a very cheeky slogan. Meaning perfection is not to have an accident. We do things so well in our electrical systems that we sell to the world that you're not going to have an accident. Perfection is not an accident. Perfection is also not having an accident. So success doesn't come from nothing. It's not just like, well, this one's lucky and more lucky at things than, than, than somebody else. No. So I say this prophetically. This is the time to apply ourselves. I'm editing a message now. I'm going to release it uh, almost right away. I look very white on that screen. Is that because of the lighting or is that the television waves? On these, I have on these I have some color about me. On that one, I look like uh, very ghostly. What the heck is that about? I'm looking across at there because you don't know what I'm talking about. There's the, the big screen is has me broadcasting on there right now. I'm looking at myself, I don't know why. Looking a bit pale on the screen there. I think it's the, maybe the television screen. Okay, so you have to look, you have to take a, a self analysis, then you have to upgrade yourself in every way to say, I'm going to do more, I'm going to have more. What I, what I need to achieve, I'm actually going to do it now. Say amen. A law of success would say this. Stop being a loser. Stop being a loser. Stop losing. And another thing you never want to do is act like you're victimized by everybody. We all get into that when we've had terrible warfares. Rise up and kick it in the head. Some things are unpleasant, but you have to rise up to attack them. So I saw Mike Tyson say it, like him or not. Muhammad Ali, like him or not. They be, Arnold Schwarzenegger, like him or not. No pain, no gain. I, I, I work on myself. I have a disciplined regimen that's painful. Let me tell you something. When, you, when you're bodybuilding, I was a bodybuilder uh, many years ago. When you tear those muscles, when you rip them by, by uh, pumping iron, and they tear, the pain is unbelievable. I remember one time I laid off for the gym for a while and I went back and I did the bench presses on the same level that I was doing it. 200 and something pounds, I don't know what it was, and I was doing 10 reps, one, two, three. I'm telling you that the, like a late, that was early in the day, by the middle of the night, like 12 hours later, I went like this and stretched back and my whole chest felt like somebody took a hot, a hot pokers of coals and just ran them across my chest. It, the pain was unbearable. I, like they say, if someone has broken ribs, how do you, or a collarbone or whatever, how do you lay down? You're going to move it. You, you can't stay in one position where all this is not going to move. So the ongoing pain is unbearable. But it's like that in the muscle tissue. Because when you, when you pump iron, you're actually tearing the muscle then when it rebuilds itself, it comes back with more, and that's how you develop the muscle tone. And your muscles get bigger. Like right now, I see it's still there. It's hard as a rock. It's never changed. Because, because the muscle has memory. You built it once, it stays like that. But to, to build up, you have to tear it down, and that takes work. Heavy exercise, heavy work in business, Heavy work in prayer, heavy work in study, heavy work in travel, heavy work in doing anything. Man, it's a, it's, it's a lot of work. Most people don't do it. That's why they don't ever get any kind of results to do big things. The spirit of wisdom from the Lord is speaking here on the laws of success. And this is fabulous. So anybody that ever preaches, like, let me tell you what church to leave. And I mean like yesterday. 
And the Lord spoke to me this morning. Oh, it's coming back to me again now. Oh, Lord. God said something to me so powerful. When he said it, in my spirit, I was so shocked by what he said. I said, huh? Like, huh? Like, you know, you say to someone, they say something, you go, huh? Like, what? Say it again. I, I did that to God. I said, huh? Then I went, I, I tried to hear it again. I'm like, what? Huh? huh? He said it again. I'm like, oh, Lord. I don't know if I should say specifically what it is. This one I'll probably... I'll probably not say because it could be a bit, uh, it's very forward and very fierce. Let me just say that. What the Lord told me to do in a certain realm. And I am going to do it. Nope. I, I could go on a side journey and speak in code and tell it like a parable. I'm not even going to do it. But what it was, was something so severely intense about people numbers and operations and all kinds of that we just we just have to go for it and do it and one thing i want to tell people that i've lived to i've lived to discover this that when you depend on other people to to support your vision or have your vision it doesn't happen they don't have it i'm not talking about people that are connected with you on a personal level even spiritually if you're a, a, a pastor or a prophet as myself, you're a leader of a ministry, you have people that are with you, but you have people on the outside that you interact with. They want to suck the life out of you. They want you to come and preach and prophesy, and we do all the time. And then they want to reciprocate nothing. They don't even want to work with you. They don't even want to... You think, oh, this is a great thing. They act so happy, and then you think you're friends, and they're not. Let me say something to all the people that work with me. Anybody that you meet in the travels with me, don't talk to them. If they want to suggest something to you, refer it back to me. Because many of these people are not really friends. They're friends for a day. When they're receiving and they're drinking everything up that you're throwing out, then the God is speaking. And then, but then the, you know, a few days later, it, goes, it gets reset back to zero. They're in their own world. They care about themselves. They don't care about you. That you don't know if you're going to have a relationship or not. And I've experienced this over and over, especially in the environs around here, the way these some of these sick people are. Their culture is cracked and whacked. And they're stingy and they're self-serving and they're insecure. You know, like one place, like do a flyer. No, they didn't want to do a flyer. Uh, you know, present this. No, they don't want to do that. You know, it's all like restrictive like that because they just care about their own thing and that's not your thing. So here's some advice I'll just say to anybody in case you're catching my drift. You have to build your own organization. run, Build your own business. Don't depend on other people. And then if you're... Here's another real slap in the face. Pew, pew. You ever see the meme when the guy slaps the guy, Batman, he slaps the guy and then the, the lines go up like the reverberation effect of the slap. One slap, pew, two, pew, two, three, pew. Jesus in heaven. You, uh, you got to look at you got to look at things in your own realm, and and uh, learn to do a lot a lot of things yourself and know what to do. Empower other people to help you, but they're there to empower the vision. Nobody's there just to be helped. Nobody's anywhere in an organization just to have a convenient thing for themselves. That's not the purpose of why they're there. According to the leader, according to the, the manifest of the plan of action, according to the mind of God, we're there to support the vision. We're there to produce great things. I have a friend, he said that he, lo he looked at a local television network. He said the studio looked so pathetic. Everything was bare bones. Everything was that... He said, he, t he mentioned the name of his uh, television director. He said, if, if, blah, he said his name. He said, if, mm, s did this for me, I would have fired him. <laughs> and this is a guy who works well with people and he has his whole dream team going on there. But he, but he said, if this guy would have set this system up like that for me in this ministry, I would have fired him because it's so lackluster. He said, People think the world is doing so great. They're not doing great. They're going down. It's going to get worse for them. 
This is a year, and I say this prophetically in the, in the topic of success. People that are on fire with God and in tune with God are going to flourish. But the people in the world and the wicked are going to do very badly. And I have so many scriptures in that that I can't even, you know, I lost count. I'm going to make a list of scriptures about what God does for his righteous and what God does for, it should be another book to write, yes. And what God does for his righteous and what God does for the wicked. Those that have hurt you and come to hurt you, they will not make it. Psalm 63 verse 9 says, 9 and 10 says, those that seek to destroy your life or hurt you in any way, they will go down into the lower parts of the earth, but their flesh will even be as food for the jackals. The jackals are like the wild dogs, like hyenas, like animals that big teeth that can tear flesh. Can you imagine the prophet said that on behalf of the Lord? And we think culturally, oh, oh just, just love them anyway. Oh, what about God's mercy? Can't they repent? All these stupid statements that people make. Well, you got to say you hope so for their sake. Or else they're going to burn in hell forever. That's not good for anybody. We don't, you can't wish that upon anybody because it's so, it's so horrible. Even the most horrific person, you still would hope that they'll rescue themselves from hell. But guess what? Nobody can rescue them from there. Only they themselves. And some people are going to get bad things happening to them because that's what they deserve. <laughs> they did it to themselves. It's not your fault. Let it happen. You tell them, you want to you wanna kill yourself? You want to commit spiritual suicide and even naturally? Help yourself. Enjoy it. We hope you're happy for all you stole and all that you ripped off and all the pain and damage and loss and destruction you caused for good people. We really hope you're going to be happy when you're being destroyed by God and by the principles of God. Isaiah 41, 11 said, Those who hate you or are against you or incensed against you will be ashamed and disgraced, and yea, they'll even become as nothing. You look for them and not find them. You look for them again and not find them. And it says, that, and then it says a, a third level of it, of God's judgment, when if you continue to strive with them, you will perish. Dear brethren, in Psalms 119, 105, the Bible says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Truly, God has sent prophet Dr. Thomas Manton IV to proclaim and declare his word of abundance and prosperity prophetically unto the nations. Thus, brothers and sisters in Christ, I urge you, just as the Bible says in Matthew 10, 41, whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet reward. Let us welcome and embrace the prophet of God by supporting his ministry. You can sow a seed, you can send your love offering. You can support or partner in the ministry program using the details displayed on your screen. For when the prophet of God decrees a blessing upon you, indeed, you shall be blessed.